Hello friends, Hal here. You've made it to Quail Studios Guitar. I put my guitar down and I'm going to play the piano today. Stay with me. I call this piece Jazz Fugue in three parts. Now I've had different names for it. Here it is. Contemporary Fugue number one in three parts. Or Why Did You Do This To Me? <laughs> and I decided to rename it to Jazz Fugue in three parts. In the comments below, tell me if you like this piece or if you hate this piece. I think you'll either hate it or you'll like it. One or the other. I don't find people that say, yeah, I, I, I kind of like it. I see, I hate that piece, or I love that piece. That's wonderful. So in the description, tell me if you hate it or you like it. Also tell me, what do you think I should call it? Jazz Fugue in three parts. That's just a description. Okay, I'm going to play it for you. Here we go. There you go. Okay, so if you want to hear a better recording of this, go to the, right there, click on that, and you will hear just the recording of this song. You can also go to Patreon and get the music to the song. Just sign up for a dollar as a patron and you can get the music, no problem. I will put the link in the, des in the description and also at the end of this video. All right, let's talk about what is a fugue for a moment. And, um, also talk about the different parts of a fugue and why this piece of music, why I love it so much. For those of you who don't know what a fugue is, a fugue is a piece of music that has um, a motive. We call it a motive in English, a motif in French. And that is the motif for this particular piece. Now, I call it contemporary fugue, contemporary fugue, <laughs> It does not stay in one key, it changes keys all the time. And also the motive is not necessarily a melodic motive. It's very interesting. Okay, so what we do is I came up with this motive right here. And what we do is we, we start in the key of G. And then the next note I hit is C, which is a perfect fourth above. And then I go to F which is a perfect fourth above that, and a B flat, a perfect fourth above that, and E flat, a perfect fourth above that. When I first thought about this piece of music, I thought, I want something that is interesting and it doesn't make a chord. Well, maybe it sort of does, but not really. I'm not gonna try to name it. Anyway, it's just compound fourth, fourths. So what we have here is I thought I'd do that, but that was difficult to pull off. So what I decided to do was take that fourth note and drop it down to B flat here. 
note, it's the same note, a perfect fifth above F, but what I did was when I dropped it down, it dropped perfect fourth, perfect fourth, perfect fifth down, perfect fourth up. So this is the motive. So I hit the G four times. And what that does is that solidifies that G note in your mind. But all of a sudden, we're hitting notes that are not in the G major scale. And in fact, that F is not in the G major scale. So the B flat is not, the E flat is not. So we're going somewhere else. But in a fugue, what's interesting is that in a uh, traditional fugue, like in uh, Well-Tempered Clavier by Bach, lots of different fugues, four-part fugues. Um, he also wrote a bunch of three-part fugues and two-part inventions and things like that. They're all very similar because they're imitative pieces. But what he does is he starts in a key. For instance, if he were to start in G major, then he would go and modulate to the key of D major, which G major has one sharp, D major has two sharps. And so he would do that pretty quickly into the piece. And then he would go back to G major, but I didn't do that. The next note is, excuse me. So what happens is that I start on G and I go up to D, that's where I start my next motive. That's a perfect fifth above G, like they would do traditionally in the Baroque and the classical eras, and any time they wrote a fugue. So the next thing I did was I went up a perfect fifth to A, which is a perfect fifth above the D. So this is what it sounds like. go to something called a sequence. So this right here is an interesting sequence because uh, I just came up with it. I don't remember how it came about, but, but I start in C major with a C major chord, and then I end up on a G minor chord, and then it goes to a C minor 7 with a B flat in the bass to a G7 with an F in the bass. And then it goes to uh, a B minor 7 inversion with a 7th in the bass to a, oh, that's an F7 with an E flat in the bass, G minor to an A major chord. Now what do I do? Oh. So I have this A major chord, and then I drop the bass note down to the C and do right there, but it goes. And then the right hand does the motive on G again. land on an A flat major chord right there. Now right here, it kind of sounds like I'm going to do something like this. Right? But I don't. So what happens is that I play the first four notes in the motive and it fools you into thinking what's going to happen. And it changes E flat to G, and then it goes to D flat, and then to C, and then to B. There's the motive. What's interesting about that part is that the motive, if it was an E, then it would be a true motive, but this is not quite a true motive. It starts on E flat. So it kind of fools us. Now I'm hitting the G again. And what happens is instead of going up, 
I'm going down, so the motive is actually upside down. And this is a way to get into, this is the G again, and I'm playing the first four notes of the motive in G, D, F sharp, D flat, and then all of a sudden, uh, that was on the left hand, right? We didn't have, right? You had this D flat and then C. So it kind of fooled you. You hear the beginning of the motive in the right hand, but it ends up in the left hand in a different key. Right hand motive, that second half of it, left hand, and this little counter motive or something that I did before, okay, comes back several times. And then we have that sequence again, but now it's a full step higher. Instead of in C, now it's on D. Uh, where's it go next? It's the same sequence as we had before. It's just transposed up a full step. And then we go to... So right here, instead of like that, when we were on D the second time we did this, now, it ends on a different note. It makes it harmonic. Now that's the motive upside down uh, without the first four notes. And then it does it again. This is the motive upside down. Now we do the motive, the complete motive, starting on A. And what we're going to do is we're going to go A, and then we're going to play it in D, and then we're going to play it in G. Just the reverse of what we did when we were doing it the first time. So it starts on A. Now what's happening is it's slow. Like that, and the left hand has notes that are moving quickly. What is this? It's the sequence again, but now it's upside down. And it, instead of traveling down the keyboard, it travels up the keyboard. Let's see if I can do this. It's the same thing, it's just transposed. Now we're on D, G, now, now we have the ending, okay, and this is what it sounds like. Now, I'm going to explain this ending to you. When we start the G motive, we start um, on the third note, right here. And that is the bass line uh, starting about five measures in. Okay, and it's very traditional. If I were to harmonize it with uh, traditional chords, it would sound something like this. Let's see what I can do here. And 
Okay? Very traditional chords. Okay, so what we have here, though, is something totally untraditional. So your mind, when it hears that bass line, I think somewhere deep down inside you know that that's a traditional bass line. But all of the harmonies on top of it are different. <laughs> so it's, it's amazing. Okay. Now what happens here is that that's our melody on top, right? But what we get, we get a clash between the bass note and the F. It's a tritone. It's a compound tritone. And now it's clashing between the B and the C. That first note clashes with the A in the bass. That note clashes with the with the C. Now what I've got here is like an E minor chord. There's an A that starts. What is that? Now this is like a G sus4. Right? G sus4? Resolving to a C. But I don't resolve. I skip over that B to the A and then to the G, and then we hit the C and the G together, but the next note you hear is an F, B, C, G. Now this E, C, G are a harmonic, it's a, it's a chord, but the F and the B. The B clashes with the C, the F clashes with the E, so we get this really jazzy ending. And then we stop. Go back and listen to it again. That's why it's so amazing. Um, it's very jazzy. It's very amazing uh, in the fact that it it avoids being harmonic all the time in a very deliberate way. Although it has very important uh, elements to it, which are the elements of having the motif the elements of having a sequence, and it goes back and forth between that. It breaks the motif up into parts. We play the beginning of the motif, right? But we don't play the ending of it. And we, we break up the beginning and the end of it. We flip it over, we do it backwards, we do it upside down, and uh, we do it many different ways. So if you listen for this, as you listen to the piece of music and listen for the... Listen for those motifs to come out and hit you, then you may enjoy it more. And you go, there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. There's part of it, there's part of it. Oh, it's upside down. And I don't know if you can tell if it's upside down on the first listening. Usually if you're not aware of that, you can't. So you'll have to listen to it many times to be able to understand it just by listening to it. Now remember, you can get the music over at Patreon. Sign up for a dollar and uh, you can get that in my posts. Look up Jazz Fugue, click on that, You'll see the, the recording of it. You'll also see um, the music there that's in a link, and you can download that. And I hope you have fun with it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being at Quail Studios Guitar. I really appreciate it. And uh, next time, we'll do a guitar piece. Talk to you later. Bye. <laughs> Bye.